Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Before you start your sermon clock, you know, you come to a hymn like that that's got ten stanzas in it, and if we were all in a Baptist church, somebody would say, hey, let's just sing stanzas three, five, and seven. Oh, you've been there. And we would all go, phew, three, five, and seven, great. Lutherans don't do that because hymns tell a story. That's the whole gospel message. I ne I've never understood why we sing that song before the pastor preaches. You don't need to preach a sermon after that. You really don't because it is the entire salvation message. So going back to what I said about the Baptist, which one of those stanzas you want to take out regarding your salvation? You want to take out five? You want to take out six? Where Christ comes and dies for you? How about eight? Let's just take that one out. That one's not important. Ah, Baptists. We Lutherans, we sing it all. Because this is what Christ has done for us. He has saved us. He has saved us. You now you see the depiction there of young Luther on the front of your worship hymnal. The echo of that hammer, boy, it can still be heard as it was used to hang Luther's 95 concerns about church abuses. Luther, of course, was an academic. He wrote these abuses in Latin, not thinking that the common people would take notice, but hoping instead that theologians might want to talk about it. They might want to debate him and debate the issues. But as you know, like wildfire, these 95 concerns, they then begin to be distributed all over Germany within two weeks. Two weeks. And then all of Europe within two months. With their posting, Luther didn't intend to start a church. He didn't intend to start or birth a movement. I came from the heart of a pastor. A pastor who didn't want the people of his congregation or the students that he taught and trained. He did not want them led astray. As a pastor, he didn't want money and indulgences to replace repentance and Christ. Martin Luther wanted to see his beloved church reformed he wanted to see it cleansed. For the state of the church in his day, boy, it was a hot mess inside a dumpster fire, inside a train wreck. It was bad. For example, within the church, salvation by works was being taught. Now this was something Luther wholeheartedly believed in until he realized what? He couldn't do it. Luther's question of how can I find a gracious God remained elusive to him and no answer was given. And as a result of that, despair, it almost gobbled him up. Something else that Rome taught was that saintly men or women like, for instance, the Blessed Virgin Mary could share some of their merit, merit that they earned by living a righteous life. They could share it with you. One could receive the merit of these saints if they were venerated and if they were prayed to, which of course led to idolatry. Purgatory seemed to be invented out of thin air 
and papal authority was placed over biblical authority. And then, if all that wasn't enough, indulgences were being sold. Forgiveness in turn for money. Now these abuses, they didn't spring up overnight. The devil takes his time sowing tares amongst the wheat. Time is on his side, as the song goes. And even though there were others before Luther actually pointing some of these abuses out, they pointed out the tares of Rome's false doctrine. God, though, used Luther more than any of the others in his half-baked list of 95 concerns. This is why the 95 theses are not in our book of Concord. It's because we would say Luther wasn't Lutheran enough yet. He used that list to forever change the world and to bring the gospel in its purity to your ears. And beloved, that is what the Lutheran church is. The Lutheran church is the church that has been cleansed by the gospel. That's what it is. Believe me, my friends say it like your friends. Oh, Lutheran church ain't nothing but Rome, like, what are they, Roman Catholic light. Right? You heard that one? <coughs> no, folks, it's the church cleansed by the gospel. Tell that to your friends next time. The Lutheran church is the church cleansed by the gospel, cleansed by the teaching of justification by grace through faith. What? I don't have to trust in a piece of paper even though it's been signed by the Pope himself? I don't have to trust in how much money I give to others or to the church? I don't have to trust in my resume of good works or pious deeds? No, no, no. For salvation is not something to be earned, merited, or achieved. Luther learned that if salvation depends in any way on his doing, then it's a work of the law, and by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Beloved, eyes set on yourself find only sin and damnation, whereas eyes that are set on Christ find only forgiveness, life, and salvation. When God the Holy Spirit led Luther to this ancient truth, he couldn't contain himself. The chains started falling off and they were dropping to the floor. And when Luther saw the Pope pulling one way and the Gospel then pulling another, that's when the Reformation began. But let's be very clear, the Reformation is not about a German monk in a remote cow pasture of Wittenberg nailing 95 church concerns to a church door in hopes of a debate. No, the Reformation is about a man, a God-man who came from heaven and who has the power to create anew. Because of this God, man's living is bleeding and is dying and rising in your place. You have been transferred from condemnation, damnation, and guilt under the law to freedom and forgiveness under the gospel where your sins are utterly, entirely, and completely forgiven. So no more working or climbing to acquire righteousness. Rather, we receive righteousness by grace through faith as a sheer gift. Our hands are open, empty hands, open unto God. And this is what He gives as a gift. No more seeking assurance based on 
your works in relationship to the law, but rather receiving assurance in Christ and His relationship to you. No more looking within for certainty, for certainty does not lie within you. It lies outside of you in Christ's Word and His sacraments. Your feelings, beloved, are fickle. They are fallen, and you do not trust in them regarding salvation. You look outside of yourself. Faith cometh by hearing. You listen to something outside of your own heart, not that which is within it. And you receive the gifts that God has for you. No more fear of death either. For death is safe for those who trust in Christ because Christ Jesus tasted death for you. So you see, forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life, again, they're all gifts to you. And His cup that He will put to your lips in just a moment, that's a gift as well. His gift. Beloved, this has been the plan of God all along to give fallen mankind a right relationship with His Maker. By grace, through faith, in the reconciling work of the Savior's death on the cross. And if I wanted you to be really mad at me, we would sing that exact same hymn, hymn number 555, all over again, right now! All stanzas. But we won't. But what we say is for those of us who have been given the treasure of the gospel and have been given entrance into the kingdom of heaven, let us, beloved, give thanks to God for giving us these gifts. And may we not take this treasure for granted, but rather may we stand upon it as Luther once stood, may we powerfully proclaim it in these gray and latter days, and may we steadfastly believe it unto our death. Blessed Reformation Day unto you all. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.